Hello friends, welcome to our new episode of A History of the Christian Church. And today we're looking at Eusebius of Caesarea, lived from around 260 to 339 AD. And he was the one who documented, well, called today's episode from empire to ecclesiastical history. So welcome friends, join us today as we embark on what I hope will be an exciting journey through the life and the mind of this guy called Eusebius of Caesarea. He was a prolific scholar, but he was also a bishop of the early church and a witness to and a historian of what most people would describe as a critical era in the history of the early Christian church. Eusebius as an individual defied convention and he in many ways reshaped Christian thought from his monumental works like the ecclesiastical history to his unique perspective on the Roman Empire Eusebius emerges as a beacon of wisdom and faith so listen today as we try or I try to unravel the layers of this enigmatic figure bridging and documenting ancient worlds as he did let's explore together how eternal truths played out through his life and the events where we see the beginnings of the merging of the church with the Roman state. So join us today because history has never been so intriguing. I'm your host, Jeremy McCandless, and today we're going to embark on this journey through the corridors of time. Buckle up because today I'm going to try and unravel the life, the man who wrote both an annal of the Christian faith and of the Roman Empire. So, fellow time travellers, grab your headphones and step with me into this metaphorical time machine. We're going to explore the ancient libraries, try and decode his cryptic passages, and try and unravel the theological puzzles which Eusebius himself wrestled with. Welcome to my history of the Christian Church. Okay, people, I'd like to begin with a biography of his life. Just as an overview of it, need to ask the question, who was Eusebius? Well, imagine a scholar, a guy with ink-stained fingers, working and based in the ancient library in the city of Caesarea. He wasn't just a historian, he was in a sense a biblical detective, piecing together truths from fragments of scrolls and scriptures. His name has been spoken of by both religious scribes and history scholars alike and remains spoken about to this day. As I said, he was born probably around 260 AD and he was born into and his life straddled two words, that of the Greek intellectual and that of the Christian, Syrian, Palestinian religious background. His writings chronicle for us both the rise of the empire and the dawn and the early days of Christianity. But it wasn't just history he wrote, he also wrote a history of the Christian faith. As eventually the Bishop of Caesarea, Eusebius stood at the crossroads of faith and politics of his time. His writing bore witness to the reign of Constantine the Great, the first supposedly, certainly the self-declared Christian Roman Empire, writing an effusive biography of him, but also drafting biographies of all the major players of that time, both emperors and martyrs. But Eusebius wasn't content with just chronicling history. No, he penned other important works, like demonstrations of the gospel, in which he went in and dissected the sacred texts a little bit like a surgeon, approaching it almost like a proto-concordance. He attempted to present and prepare and present the good news of Jesus in a way that could be understood as a way of unravelling the sacred mysteries containing within the text, smoothing the path of understanding for believers who would follow. Furthermore, in his ecclesiastical history, Eusebius wove together a tapestry which contained both the core of the faith, the theological positions, alongside the stories of the various saints and sinners. 
He wasn't just the father of church history. He has been described as the one who was the scriber of the souls of the early Christian lives, etching their struggles, their triumphs into parchments and seamlessly incorporating them into the history of the church. But he did more than that. His writing also dipped into controversies of his time, discussing discrepancies as he saw them within the Gospels, but coming up with solutions and trying to explain them. He also was involved in the great theological debates of that time on the nature of the Trinity and other things, debates that have continued to echo down through time to this day. Eusebius, in fact, didn't shy away from controversial waters. In fact, we might say he dived headfirst into the stormy seas of his time, seeking truth amid the turbulent times in which he lived. So let's think about his early life. Well, little is known about the early life of Eusebius, in fact. His successor in the church at Caesarea, Achaicus, he wrote a life of Eusebius, but apart from portions of that, there isn't really anything else about him written at the time he lived, and if there was, it's been lost to antiquity. Eusebius, of course, his own surviving works are there, but they only represent a portion of his total outwork. The major source is still accessible to us today in terms of writings about him are by the 5th century ecclesiastical historians, a guy called Socrates, and some other material is available by the 4th century Christian author Jerome. There are, of course, assorted notices of his activities and things he'd done seen in the writings of some contemporaries from the time, people like Athenaeus, Arius, and Alexander of Alexandria, one of Eusebius' own students, in fact. What we do know is that Eusebius was, I say, born in the early 260s in what we would today call Palestine. He studied and worked under this guy called Pamphilius, who was in charge of Oregon's library at Caesarea. Like Pamphilius, Eusebius was an ardent admirer of Oregon, and they actually jointly wrote an autobiography and a defense of him together. Eusebius is primarily remembered as the historian and the father of church history because he wrote a chronicle of both the history of the world and also as a history of the martyrs in Palestine as well as, of course, his major work of ecclesiastical history. These earlier historical books covered things like the martyrs and the persecutions that had occurred around 303 to 313 AD. But his greatest work, no doubt, is his history of the church, his ecclesiastical history, which traces the progress of the church from the earliest times in the book of Acts to around 324 AD. Tracing and showing, of course, Constantine's emergence as becoming the sole emperor of the east as well as the western spans of the Roman Empire. His work is of immense value, especially in the way that he preserves many documents which otherwise would have remained an unknown or lost to history. Writing the history of the early church without Eusebius has been compared to like attempting to write a history of the early apostolic church without the book in the Bible called the Acts of Apostles. It's seen as that poor and that important. Eusebius in his writings, of course, as a believer, saw the hand of the providence of God in the life of the church and even in the death of those who were prosecuted and martyred as all representing the triumphal march of Christianity. As I said, Eusebius wrote a enthusiastic chronicle of the life of Constantine as well as, in fact, two lesser works about him. He was an ardent admirer of the empire. For Eusebius, the conversion of Constantine was in fact the establishment of the Christian empire. He saw that as both natural and a desirable outworking of the Christian faith. He had no qualms at all about the linking of Christianity with the empire. He had a particularly exalted view of Constantine as a Christian empire, actually seeing him as God's representative on earth. Himself, he was baptised and nurtured in the city of Carthage, and it was there that Eusebius at a young age witnessed the tumultuous effects of the Diocletian persecution through the province of Syria and Palestine, which occurred in around the year 296. A sight that must undoubtedly have been etched indelibly in his mind, 
events that were chronicled in detail in the pages of his historical works. Raised initially to the Presbyterial offices under the auspices of Agapius of Caesarea, Eusebius's former years were steeped under the learning of such theological luminaries as Dorotheus of Tyre, whose wise exegesis and explanation of the scriptures was the thing that many say kindled his intellectual fervour and approach to Christianity right from the beginning. You see, Caesarea was a place of intense Christian thinking and activity. And in this fertile intellectual soil, one would say planted by Oregon and then his disciple Pamphilus, and by the placing of the library there, the seeds, the seeds of what we would call today Christian scholarship flourished, bearing fruit in the formation of this ever-expanding library of sacred writings and knowledge first established by Oregon. Oregon's unrelenting efforts in cataloguing the various usages of the gospel texts laid the groundwork for the compilation of what would become an accepted canon of Christian writings. In the halls of this library and in Pamphilus's own academy within the library, Eusebius's scholarly pursuits found their natural home and he laboured tirelessly to expand the library's corpus, incorporating and gathering and cataloguing works from across the empire and also refining and revising biblical text with meticulous care for accuracy. Thus, amid this scholarly hothouse of Caesarea, Asabius emerged eventually in his own time as a luminary in his own right. His own catalogue of works stands as a monument to the enduring legacy of Oregon and then Pamphilius and their academic enterprises before him upon which he built. In the 290s, Eusebius began to work on his most important work called The Ecclesiastical History, a narrative history of the church and the Christian community from the apostolic age to his own time. At about the same time, he worked in his, on his what is called his Chronicle, which was a universal calendar of events from creation to again his own time. He completed the first editions of this, of both of these, in fact, his ecclesiastical history and this thing called the Chronicle, about or before 300 AD. Just thinking a minute of his role of Bishop of Caesarea, you see, in early history, many would say the rise of Asabius from presbyter to receiving what was called the Episcopal throne of Caesarea, in other words, becoming bishop there, marks a pivotal moment in Christian history because it also heralded an era that would be fraught with theological strife and doctrinal discord. Elevated to this position, he immediately found himself embroiled in these tumultuous controversies of his age, finding himself in fact summoned to arbitrate in many of these important events, including things like the excommunication of the disgraced Arius. Under the auspices of Emperor Constantine, Eusebius did indeed flourish in these roles, affording him a platform of great influence. In fact, he was tasked with presenting the creed of his own church to the assembly of the Council of Nicaea. His efforts were later crystallised into the enduring form of the Nicaean Creed. Now, I did intend to do include a section on that within this study of the life of Eusebius, but I've actually decided to pair that off and to make that a separate episode, which we look at together next time. It's that important. Anyway, amid the theological storms that were engulfing the Christian world at this time, Eusebius sometimes found himself at odds with adversaries from within his own ranks. Eustathius of Antioch, a champion of Nicene Orthodoxy, decried Eusebius's potential allegiance to the theological doctrines of Oregon, accusing him of in fact straying from the Orthodox past. But despite his distractors, Eusebius emerged triumphant and perhaps was the key orchestrator of the disposition of Eusthenaeus at a synagogue later in Antioch. However, the spectre of dissent loomed larger and larger, particularly with the emergence of a formidable adversary in the person of Athenaeus of Alexander. 
he was summoned before the synods convened under the aegis of eusebius and in fact Athavius, Athenaeus eventually faced condemnation and exile but in a sense his cause was still championed to a degree by a beleaguered eusebius amid the ever shifting tides of imperial politics even as the political landscape shifted again with the passing of emperor constantine eusebius retained his position of influence his fidelity to the roman imperial cause earned him repeated reprieve from censure or even worse in the aftermath of constantine's death which occurred around 337 eusebius penned and completed his magisterial work the life of constantine it stands as a testament to his enduring legacy as emperor but it also marked out eusebius as the chronicler of his age weaving together eyewitness accounts primary source material he attempted to immortalize the reign of the first ever self-declared christian roman emperor and that book remains of primary importance to this day okay let's consider his complete library his works in the vast library of eusebius's output a representative portion has endured the test of time even though there are some aspects of it where suspicion still falls on him because of his the shadow of arianism and his relationship to it however his methodology of meticulous historical authorship has rendered him indispensable especially when compared with other writers of that era in trying to understand what was going on by his use of comprehensive excerpts from primary sources eusebius has bequeathed to posterity a treasure trove of knowledge that might otherwise have been lost the literary journey of eusebius mirrors the actual story of his life in his formative years he went deep into the realms of biblical criticism under the tutorage of people like his mentor pamphlius and stood among and learned within the various disciples of that well-respected school of antioch the persecutions also then he witnessed as a young man under the fire lit by diocletian and later galerius ignited with him a zeal for the martyrs of his era and also caused him to be motivated to look at the martyrs of ages past leading him to go down the path of actually recording what today is almost a recognizable standard a genre of ecclesiastical history as the chaos of the arian controversies also engulfed the christian world later eusebius would turn his writing towards the theological debates and battlegrounds grappling with the complexities of those dogmatic disputes and then of course the big thing the dawn of the state recognition for christianity offered up new areas of inquiry before him prompting him to craft apologetics tailored to meet the requirements of the particular political age and we see that in his homage to the patronage of the roman emperor constantine eusebius wrote this extravagant almost a eulogy as i've mentioned earlier a biography that ultimately was celebrating the emperor's pivotal role in the annals of history and his appearing as a self-declared christian leading a christian empire yet amid what some might say these political maneuvers eusebius's works also encompass a wide diverse range of other writing from impassioned addresses or sermons if you like to devotional letters and even exegetical treaties and huge expanse of scholarly bible commentaries spanning his whole lifetime in his complete library of works these multifaceted works stand as a testament to both his commitment and his dedication to the interpretation of sacred text and alongside the preservation of historically reliable writing ensuring his enduring importance not only in the history of the christian church but as a historian in general so let's think about his literacy legacy and examine the wide ranging of his work firstly of course there is his biblical textual criticism eusebius alongside his library mentor pamphilius a tutor if you like for several years together they dedicated themselves to this textual study of both the septicant 
that was the version of the Old Testament, and notably the recently completed canon of New Testament scriptures. Building upon the groundwork, first laid by Oregon, Eusebius and Pamphilius revised and published a new edition of the Septicant. Innovatively, Eusebius structured his edition of the New Testament into easily navigable verses, supplementing it with what he called synoptic tables, in effect a forerunner to our modern chapter system, thereby facilitating access to what he called periscopes, i.e. sets of verses that form one coherent unit of thought, which immediately will recognize as something very similar to what we would today call paragraphs. These canonical tables and periscopes, as he called them, came commonly referred to as Eusebian canons and endured well beyond the Middle Ages until eventually superseded by the verses and chapter structures we see in our modern Bibles today. But it was almost a thousand years later that this happened. Eusebian's magnum opus was a work called the Chronicle. It comprised of two distinct components. The first section offered a concise summary of global history gleaned from wide-ranging resources and was organised along national lines. Complementing this, the second part of the work, called the Canons, presented a harmonised arrangement of historical events in parallel columns, akin to what we would today call a modern timeline, thereby establishing another standard way of presenting history. Now, although the original Greek text of the Chronicle has been lost, its form of presenting history was established and was continued and was used by many later historians, and that in itself confirms the enduring significance as that having been one of the foundational texts in the way we approach and record history. Although sh shortened, an Armenian version rendering of this work has safeguarded the essence of the structure of this monumental work, extending its authenticity back to around the middle of the 4th century. Okay, his other seminal work, his church history, is ecclesiastical history. Eusebius has left to posterity the earliest surviving chronicle of the history of the Christian church meticulously charting its journey from the apostolic age to his contemporary era. Although placing history within this chronological framework and a framework that positively aligns with the reigns of Roman empires, this exhaustive narrative not only encompasses a wide array of subjects from the lives of bishops, of theologians, but also documents different interactions between Christian, Jews, the Roman state, and also perceived heretics. Additionally, the martyrdom of early Christians up to the year 324 are commemorated extensively within its pages. Now, despite occasional questions regarding its veracity and its biases, Eusebius's ecclesiastical history still endures as a crucial primary source, offering invaluable insights into the formative years of Christianity. Enriched by his access to now what are lost materials. I myself, when I studied early church history and culture way back in the 1990s, the foundational text we had to use was a book called A New Eusebius, a modern paraphrase of his ecclesiastical history, demonstrating to me the importance in which he stands as the historian of early church history. His other monumental work, a Life of Constantine, well, that stands as an almost eulogistic a tribute to the life of the emperor, very much diverging from the objective tone of his previous church histories. As the early noted other historian from a few centuries later, Socrates Scholacticus noted, Eusebius, in his veil to extol the virtues of Emperor Constantine, tends to prioritise rhetorical elegance over factual precision, a tendency that permeates his portrayal of many historical events. You see, in rec in recounting things like this extraordinary events surrounding Constantine's conversion to Christianity, in this book Eusebius weaves the story of divine intervention, culminating in the famous story of the emperor's vision of a luminous cross emblazoned with the words, In hoc 
signo vincius, by this you conquer. This encounter purportedly occurred to have happened on the eve of a battle at Milvan Bridge has become enshrined in Christian tradition as a pivotal moment in the history of the faith. However, discrepancies emerge when comparing Eusebius' accounts with contemporary sources like Lactinius and others who recount Constantine himself originally describing it as a revelatory dream rather than a physical celestial vision as described by Eusebius. In fact, the commemorative arch that Constantine himself erected in 315 AD to commemorate this battle offers no visual testament to the vision or even uses any Christian symbols within it in order to commemorate or celebrate his victory at that battle at Milvan Bridge. As well as his major historical works, he wrote some less significant historical works. Prior to his, his imposing church history, Eusebius also undertook the editing of some lesser-known historical works. Among these were compilations of martyrdoms from the early period and also a biography of his own mentor, Pamphilius. While many of these works have not survived the passing of time, fragments do remain and they provide glimpses into the lives and sacrifices of some very early Christian martyrs. Noteworthy among these fragments is an epistle detailing the martyrdom of Polycarp, which I quoted from, in fact, in the episode that covered Polycarp's life. Along with that, there are accounts of other martyrs, such as Pioneus and Carpus, as well as many other minor figures. Additionally, Eusebius's narrative within those books encompasses often harrowing tales of persecution endured by congregations in places that we would today describe as modern-day France and Palestine, occurring during the reign of Diocletian. In many ways, and in a sense, it was the father of the later-to-come Fox's Book of Martyrs. Although fragmentary, the historical sketches still available to us today offer valuable insights into the trials and tribulations faced by these earliest Christians and definitely enrich our understanding of the turbulent ecop in which the early church emerged. But as well as this, he also wrote apologetic and dogmatic works. Within the realm of apologetics and dogmatics, Eusebian's work is a testament to his fervent desire to present a defence of Christian doctrine and his own zeal for interpreting its core beliefs to a broader, wider audience. Among his notable contributions are an apology for Oregon. Initially, this was penned with his, tu his, his mentor, Pamphilius. It is a collaborative work in which he spans the whole Christian philosophical landscape, contending against the appearance of some new emerging Christian heresies that stood in opposition to the teaching of Oregon. In his other work, Preparation for the Gospel, another monumental piece, actually what today would be 15 books, this work served as an even more expansive and robust defence of Christianity against not only pagan philosophies, but emerging cults and religions of his time. In it, Eusebius cleverly offers us a compelling case for the superiority of Christianity to all these emerging cults, whilst at the same time preserving invaluable insights from the various philosophical traditions where he feels they still have value. In his Proof of the Gospel, which is closely related to the, the previous work, his preparation for the Gospel series, Eusebius examines the person of Jesus Christ across, would you believe it, 20 books, of which 10 survive intact today. Through these, there are meticulous arguments presented in which he demonstrates the validity of the Christian message and the core identity of the person of Jesus Christ as the Son of God. He also produced a book called Prophetic Extracts. Now that was originally part of a broader introductory work on Christian faith, and in this lengthy exposition, in fact it's preserved in four books today, it examines the messianic texts from scripture, including the messianic prophetic texts from the Old Testament. Only fragments and sections remain today, but they do offer glimpses into Eusebius's prowess of offering critical explanation and ability 
to interpret scripture, particularly when it comes to examining the Old Testament prophetic books of the Bible. Eusebius also wrote polemical essays. He directed his ability to public speak, his rhetorical powers of persuasion against adversaries within the Christian fold as well. His treatise against Marcellus of Ancra, aptly titled Against Marcellus, and its supplement Ecclesiastical Theology, well, their notable contributions to the ongoing theological debates of his, of his time and his opposition to emerging cults and false doctrines. Eusebius' enduring impact within this realm of what is called apologetics and dogmatics, in other words, defences of the faith against emerging worldviews, extends beyond his own works because some would say it helped, in a sense, launch and motivate that spirit of intellectual inquiry that inspired subsequent needed, much needed and fervent defences of the Christian faith down through history. His legacy in this area persists as, in a sense, a beacon of theological scholarship and someone who had a passionate advocacy for the defence of the gospel and the Christian cause. Let's think a moment about his exegetal works. Eusebius also wrote what we would today call biblical commentaries, and several of these biblical commentaries have left an indelible mark on that field of theological thinking as well. His monumental commentary of Psalms showcases Eusebius' ability to meticulously analyse not just history but biblical text. He also wrote a commentary on Isaiah. This recently was only recently discovered in manuscript form in Florence in the early 20th century, but it has offered helpful interpretations of the prophetic book of Isaiah, certainly enriching our understanding of how these books were interpreted at that time, which many would say has been significant in enriching our understanding of early Christian perspective on these things. There are also fragments of commentaries on Romans and 1 Corinthians. Well, they've also survived, and they provide important glimpses and insights into Eusebius's theological thoughts on the Pauline epistles. Additionally, Eusebius penned a notable work titled On the Differences of the Gospels, Including Solutions. That's its full title, aimed at actually pointing out apparent discrepancies between the gospel accounts, but also reconciling those discrepancies as they appear. Now, of course, there were also many, many originally documents of Eusebius' addresses and his sermons, but many most, in fact, have vanished. A few have endured, including a well-known sermon he offered at the consecration of a church in Tyre and an address that he gave commemorating the 30th anniversary of Constantine's reign in 336. Not surprisingly, that survived because it was scribed by the Roman state. Let's move on from his writings now and consider his doctrine, how they informed his doctrine. I think the big point that you can see is controversially for some is the fact that Eusebius, in the overall context of his writing, emerges as a distinctive figure with a particular end times perspective. He embraced what is called a preterist view, thereby emphasizing the fulfillment of some biblical prophecy already through the history and the emergence of the Christianized Roman state. According to him, the unmistakable signs of Christ's advent were intricately linked to the cessation of the Hebrew institutions. The kingly, prophetic and priestly offices, alongside the destruction of Jerusalem and its sacred temple, he argued, heralded the presence of Christ in a manner unparalleled in history, aligned with the prophetic utterances of Scripture. Many would day look at that positive interpretation of the destruction of the temple and the abominations that followed on as a particular troubling interpretation of those events. events. But from a doctrinal standpoint, Eusebius shares similarities with Oregon, particularly in his conception of the absolute sovereignty of God. For Eusebius, God stands as the ultimate cause of all existence, encompassing within himself every virtue and blessing, a perspective that many would recognize as a core tenant of Orthodox faith to this day. 
Christ, as the divine emissary, extends these blessings to humanity, and by coming he bridges the gap between the divine and the created order, Eusebius believe. Notably, he distinguishes the Son somewhat from the Father, likening that relationship to a ray emanating from its source. Central to Eusebius's theology is the affirmation of human free will and responsibility for moral choices. He contends that individuals are endowed with free will by God and possess the capacity to discern and to choose between good and evil. Sin, therefore, rises not from an inherent defect in human nature, but actually from the existence of free will in opposition to the natural law of God. In that the logos that has been inscribed within every soul. Consequently, accountability rests upon the individual who through volition either agrees with, adheres to, or deviates from the dictates of the natural revealed law in the heart of every man and woman. One additional intriguing anecdote attributed to Eusebius involves a purported letter to Constantine's daughter, Constantinia, in which he declines her request for images of Christ. Now this letter, of course, later is cited in many ecclesiastical councils and is used to represent and underscore Eusebius' stance against the use of religious imagery. Although there is little doubt that that was his position in terms of that actual work and that writing, doubts persist regarding its authenticity and authorship. But in sum, we can say that Eusebius's theological framework is characterized firstly and foremostly by this preterist eschatology, leading to what someone described as what today is sometimes referred to as a kingdom now theology, in which the church is embodied in the state, that Christ is fully revealed within the church, which of course is problematic by those coming to these events or to a Christian worldview or theology from a Reformed or Protestant tradition. So thinking about his legacy, Eusebius of Caesarea, his legacy I would say is primarily as a historian, and as such he is a subject of both admiration and some criticism, with scholars offering diverse views of both his works and his method. Critics like the early Scholasticus, or even more recently Edward Gibbon, of the rise and fall of the Roman Empire fame, and even more recently than that, Jacob Buchhart have questioned the accuracy and integrity of Eusebius' historical accounts. They argue that his writings, particularly his life of Constantine, were more conserved with praising the emperor and advancing the political agendas within the Roman state at that time, rather than providing accurate historical records. But yet, despite these debates, many scholars recognize the value of Eusebius's work, particularly for his wealth of quotations and his use of source documents and materials, which would not be available to us today had Eusebius not catalogued them. So whilst acknowledging his shortcomings, most scholars emphasize and recognize the importance of Eusebius' contribution to the preservation and transmission of historical and theological knowledge down through the ages. He was perhaps not as quite as astute a theologian as he was a historian, and many would say he appeared to support heretics. In fact, Irenaeus, who was provisionally excommunicated by the Council of Antioch, in many ways was seen to have had an opportunity to rehabilitate himself, which he did with the support of Eusebius, or with the support of the thinking and writings of Eusebius. We'll consider those events in the next episode. I think it's fair to say that Eusebius's clear theological shortcomings as some would suggest him, should not be allowed to obscure completely his achievement as a church historian. His history of the church, although partial, certainly partial to the Roman Empire, was particularly well written by the standards of the day, and providing one approaches it in the understanding of the motivation in writing it, we can still learn a lot from it, and we can still see how it laid the foundation for the writing of church history a foundation upon which others have built to this day. Okay, so let me try and summarize and wrap this whole thing up and draw it all together. As we conclude our exploration of Eusebius, 
of Caesarea, it's useful to consider how his life and work from a non-Roman Catholic perspective have panned out. While Eusebius undoubtedly made significant contribution to the preservation of early church history, his methods and his most motivations must remain subject to critical analysis, I believe. Eusebius' clear tendency to prioritise political expediency and his promotion of the Roman imperial Christian state would raise concerns for many about his potential fidelity to the truth. Scripture itself warns against compromising the integrity of the gospel for the sake of worldly gain or favour. In fact, in Galatians 1.10, the Apostle Paul writes and asks the question, For am I now seeking the approval of man or God? Or am I trying to please man? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. So, Eusebius' selective presentation of historical events and his willingness to admit inconvenient truth calls into question the reliability of his accounts. As stewards of the truth, Christians are called to uphold honesty and integrity in all aspects of life, including even work, and of course in this case, historical scholarship. While Eusebius' works remains highly valuable for its preservation of early Christian sources, his shortcomings should serve as a reminder of the importance of discernment and critical engagement with historical texts when held and examined alongside biblical texts. Christian believers, when approaching church history, must always strive to preserve the truth with humility and diligence, seeking the guidance of the Holy Spirit in their quest for understanding. That's by very nature the Christian view of church history. In John 8 verse 32, Jesus declares, And you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. So in conclusion, while Eusebius of Caesarea's contributions to Christian history are enormously significant. His legacy reminds us, I believe, of the need for discernment and a fidelity to truth in all scholarly endeavours. And it warns us of the danger of overreach when merging Christianity to the point of it becoming a sanctioned state religion. It reminds me that as I continue to study the history of our faith in this podcast series that I must try and remain steadfast to my commitment to upholding the truth of the core Christian message revealed throughout the history of the church, guided by the wisdom indeed of these great men and women of thinking of faith, but at the same time remaining true to the scriptures that for the most part, most of the people that we will examine in this series loved and were inspired in everything they said and did. Thanks for being with me today. Can I just remind you that you can subscribe to this podcast wherever it is you're receiving it, and that way you shouldn't miss another single episode. Every time a new one's posted, you'll get a notification. This podcast is free on all the made podcast platforms, but if you'd like to support this ministry and ensure and facilitate further episodes coming, you can partner with me over on Patreon. There should be a link in the podcast description. If not, just visit us where it's hosted on the history of the Christian church at buzzsprout.com and you'll be able to connect with us there. Thanks for being with me today. I hope to see you again very soon, and bye for now.